Thanks, Garrett. Thanks, Bill, all for the invitation. It's great to be here. My first time uh, in Atlanta. Seems like a great city. Um, as Garrett mentioned, my lab has been interested in uh, how the cortex represents information and processes information in the context of sensory information. And we do this in the whisker system of rodents, which is a really has a lot of advantages to figure out some of the key nuts and bolts for how the cortex is organized. Um, and we do many different things in this area, as Garrett hinted, but actually what I want to talk about today is a question that seems so simple at its outset, but yet is really complicated and interesting. And that is, there's a map in somatosensory cortex, like in all primary cortices, what is mapped? What is mapped in whisker somatosensory cortex? So that's what I want to talk about today. So in primary sensory cortex in general, uh, I think the field feels like it's been very clear for years how this organization works and what's mapped. And the main idea um, arises from work in visual cortex. This is a classic orientation map across a little chunk of V1, where the colors show patches of neurons that are tuned for different uh, orientations. And within this map, the idea, supported by many, many studies, has been um, that individual neurons are tuned for local sensory features, like some orientation that's produced by some specific circuit, and that there's a neighborhood around each neuron that contains uh, cells that are co-tuned for that same feature, right? That's the classic Mount Castle cortical column uh, from 1957. And the idea is that those columns are then topographically arranged to form um, these nice maps. And actually, in S1, the idea has been even simpler because the main map parameter that's thought to be um, spread out across the cortex is simply a place on the surface of the body, somatotopic location. So the idea is that there are columns and a simple somatotopic map um, in S1. Is this true? Well, a number of years ago, some experiments were done by Clay Reed's group, which showed that if you look more closely, there are more subtle and interesting aspects of these maps that really, I think, challenge us to understand what's really going on. And two of the key experiments are shown here. These are two photon calcium imaging experiments. Um, each little blob here is a cell in cat V1 or in rat V1. And what they're doing is they're applying different visual stimuli of different orientations and then showing you in color for every single cell at cellular resolution um, what was the preferred orientation for that cell. And here's a little chunk of V1 around an orientation pinwheel. And you can see that there's a big blob of cells which like you know, this orientation, a big blob over here which like the opposite orientation. That is, we see nice orientation columns just like in the classic Hubel and Weasel, Mount Castle type models. But when they did exactly the same experiments in rats, in rat V1, they found this. Neurons are still beautifully tuned for orientation, but now they're completely intermixed in a salt and pepper pattern. And so this idea of salt and pepper maps was first discovered here, but then was examined in multiple studies in V1, in many studies in A1, where it's still a bit controversial, but there's still there's very strong evidence for salt and pepper organization. And as I'll show you in S1, and it really seems like a salt and pepper organization is the way primary cortex is put together in rodents. Okay, so how do we understand this? Are rodents fundamentally different from these bigger animals? How does this organization work? Now, one interesting um, conceptual idea that came from studying these intermixed, dispersed rodent maps is that if you think about all the cells that are tuned for one particular orientation, like the yellow one, they're separated in cortex, but beautiful experiments by Tom Mercek Flogel and others showed that those cells which might be co-tuned for a particular orientation, that is representing a particular input, they're actually synaptically linked, even though they're spread apart. So the idea has been that in rodents, you have ensembles of cells that are tuned for particular sensory features, but they're just not clustered together in a column, they're spread apart, and what matters is the membership of a cell in its synaptic ensemble, that's what determines its tuning, not its particular location. And the analogy, which I think has been very influential, is if you imagine a circuit board doing some useful computation in your computer, you could, in principle, take the locations of all the individual logical elements and you could scramble them as long as you preserve the wiring, and that circuit would roughly, maybe even perfectly, perform the same. Maybe that's what's happened here in these salt and pepper maps of cortex. So the questions that this raised for us is how to understand this. Is this true? First of all, are salt and pepper maps an inherent property of rodent sensory cortex? Um, when you look at a map like this, does this map completely lack columns, which has been the idea? That is, the Mount Castle idea of co-tuned cells, is that just wrong in rodents? And if so, are columns irrelevant for neuron sensory tuning? A neuron sitting here and a neuron uh, sitting here have very, very different tuning, even though they're in the same neighborhood. Is that really true? Does neighborhood have no impact? Okay, so these are the questions I want to get at. So the whisker system is a great place to study this. 
because the whiskers are these mobile tactile devices, as I'm sure you've heard. But there's a beautiful representation in S1 cortex of the entire body map in a nice somatotopic way, including in rodents, a clearly definable anatomical column for each whisker on the face. And that's shown here in a little schematic. And we know these are real because in layer four, there's actually a physical cluster of cells called a barrel that sits in the middle of a radial column. And there's one of those barrels, one of those columns, for each whisker on the face in a perfect map. Okay? Uh, and here's just one way that we know this. This is cytochrome oxidase staining. Here's the, uh, the arrangement of whiskers on the face shown in uh, those barrels in layer four of S1, for example, for the D1, D2, D3, and D4 vibrissa. Okay? So it's a beautifully organized place. And many, many old studies with classic single electrode, tungsten electrode recordings showed that if you look at the average tuning of cells in, in a given column, they look beautifully precise. That is, if you wiggle the D1 whisker and ask where within this overall anatomical map do cells spike, they spike pretty much in the D1 column, maybe a little bit around it. If you wiggle D2, cells spike in the D2 column and just a little bit around it, reinforcing this one whisker, one column kind of perfect topography model. Okay. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention is that there's an anatomical finding, a set of them, which reinforce the idea that one whisker, one column makes sense, and that's because thalamic input representing those whisker deflections arrives in layer four in those little tight little clusters of cells, and then the intracolumnar circuits that originate in layer four are actually quite largely radial. These layer four cells project beautifully and strongly to overlying cells in layer two, three of the same column and also to the deep layers not shown here. And there's lots of interesting circuits, but they're very strongly linked within columns. Now that idea, I have to say, ignores important things. It ignores, for example, in layer two, three, the fact that cells get lots of longer distance inputs. They get inputs from nearby columns. They get inputs from uh, uh, structures that don't map the whiskers in a topographic way or from top-down cognitive information. So really, there's a lot of anatomical basis to think that maybe there's a more complicated mapping, but what is it? Okay, and that's what I want to get at today. When we think about the whisker map, did we think that all the cells in a given column are tuned for the features of how that column's whisker is moving, maybe position or acceleration or velocity, but some kind of single whisker features? Or should we think about a salt and pepper map where those neurons are dispersed like in the V1 case. Okay, so we um, did an early study a number of years ago um, to, to get at this. Um, this is a calcium imaging study that looks at single cell resolution at the structure of that map in layer two, three, okay? And so Kelly Clancy, who's a grad student in the lab, uh, exposed a region over S1 here in a little cranial window, used intrinsic signal imaging to find the column for one whisker, like the D2 whisker on the face, and then focused in on that column, loaded all the cells with OGB, which is a slightly old-fashioned but still very good calcium dye, and then under anesthesia, wiggled a large array of whiskers in a pseudo-random kind of sparse noise way to map the receptive fields of all those cells. Okay? And here's what the, this looks like, actually, with a more modern uh, dye. This is G-CAMP. Oh, this is really not projecting well, but there's lots of pyramidal cells there. We're wiggling the whiskers. This is sped up quite a bit. And then you can see different neurons flashing in response to different whiskers. So we can draw an analysis circle around one of these cells and then um, show you here in grayscale the fluorescence response of that cell over many trials of wiggling these nine different whiskers. And so you can see that this cell, for example, loves the D1 whisker and doesn't like other whiskers. So this would be a receptive field map for this cell. So what does the tuning for cells look like in one single column? Uh, these are, this is an imaging field that's localized to the center of the D2 whisker column. Cells are color coded by which whisker actually drives them best. And you can see that just like in rat V1, um, there's a salt and pepper intermixing of cells tuned for lots of different. And this is a very, very prominent um, thing. I'll point out one example. These are the five most responsive cells Cell number two in this field, which is in the D2 column, really does respond best, this is delta F over F, to the D2 whisker and not to the other one. So this cell is like correctly tuned for the whisker for this column, but all these other cells are tuned for different whiskers. Okay, and the summary of this uh, study uh, can be seen here where we localize a bunch of the imaging fields, color coding the cells by their best whisker as I showed you before, and we're localizing them to the actual anatomical outlines of the columns that they came from, right? And you can see that in each case, there's salt and pepper intermixing. But if you count carefully, what you'll see is that the largest number of cells are always tuned for the correct whisker for that column. 
about 50% of the cells. The other cells are tuned for any of the number immediate neighboring whiskers. And so what this means is that in layer 2-3 by this method, it looks like the map is salt and pepper, but it's correct on average just with very high local scatter. Okay? So there's a number of important caveats to interpreting studies like this. One of them is that that was done under anesthesia. Maybe when the animal wakes up and the brain is more active, maybe circuits reorganize a bit, uh, and maybe there's beautiful responses that are perfectly topographic. Right? So we wanted to measure a receptive field map in awake animals. And in the whiskers, this is very challenging. Because when animals wake up and are interested in something, they actively move their whiskers around, which is great for them. But as experimentalists, it means we can't apply a calibrated deflection to each of those whiskers like you need to to map a receptive field. So how do we do this? So we came up with a method to be able to do this. We took advantage of the fact that mice and rats, when they're in a tight spatial position, they will actually rest their whiskers on nearby objects and not move their whiskers. But you can show by delivering stimuli like to a moving wall panel that they can still detect and discriminate in that case. So there's a passive whisker function that they can use even when they're not whisking, but they're attending. And so here, we trained mice to be head fixed under a two-photon microscope. We inserted nine different whiskers into an array of different independently controllable piezos. Um, and then we would wiggle either deflections of those nine single individual whiskers. And the animal was trained that when we do this, don't bother to lick, you'll never get a reward. So that's uh, S minus or no reward stimulus. And then occasionally, we'll wiggle all whiskers together. And when we do that, the animal's trained lick and get a reward. So the animal licks to that stimulus. We also throw in some other stimuli, like a couple of different tones that are not rewarded and some blanks that are not rewarded. The animal learns to do this task very well. Um, here's over a bunch of training days, the average behavioral response, the licking of a bunch of mice to the, whisk, the all whisker S plus stimulus. The mice learns to lick to those. The mice rapidly learns to, to suppress their responses to the single whisker stimuli here. And then they res respond even less to the tones or the blanks. And the fact that they make more, more incorrect responses, false alarms, to the individual whiskers, which they shouldn't, than to tones, means to us that they're actually paying attention to the whiskers. Right? That's an important result. So we have an animal that's receiving all these stimuli, and it's attentive to the whiskers. And what we're going to do is the animal cares about this stimulus, but we are going to care about these stimuli because here we're delivering calibrated stimuli. The animal's not licking, which would contaminate these responses, and we're going to map receptive fields to those stimuli. Okay. And what do we see? So this is results from a number of mice that are all put into a common reference frame. Um, the black circle here is the boundaries of a reference column. The center of the column is in the middle. The position of each symbol is the position of a cell. Okay? And actually, these cells are all being collapsed onto exactly the same reference field. So the black circle is the same column in all cases, but I'm just separating out the cells. The red cells in the middle are the ones that were tuned for the whisker corresponding to this column. These are the correctly tuned cells. right? And there's lots of them. But you can see that intermixed within those same population were many cells that were tuned for the next whisker over in this direction, or the next whisker in this direction, or this one, or this one, and in fact, all the surround whiskers. And if you add these up, about 50% of cells are tuned for the correct whisker, and the other ones are tuned for nearby whiskers. So the salt and pepper intermixing happens even in the awake, attentive animal. Okay, and this is, again, in layer 2-3. Now, if you stand back a little bit and say, outside that one column, is there still correct average structure? You see beautifully the correct average structure. Now our column of focus here is just the small black circle in the middle, and cells that are located outside it are, are positioned at their correct locations outside it. And so the cells that are responsive to this central whisker, these guys here, are not only found within that column, but they're also found in the neighboring columns. That's the salt and pepper map. Uh, and cells that were responsive to the whisker that was one row closer to me on the face tend to be located here. The cells one row in the other direction uh, located over here, et cetera. And so you can see that the central focus of all these is topographically orderly around the central column. That's the average map. So the average map is correct, but there's this tremendously high local scatter. Now I'll throw in a little fact for you. That was all pyramidal cells. We're doing cell type specific imaging. It's not true for every cell type. Um, one of the key inhibitory cell types in cortex is the parvalbum or PV interneuron, and they have many interesting properties, which we study in other projects. But one cool property about them is that they receive input from virtually every pyramidal cell within 100, 150 microns around them, 
they provide inhibitory output to those same cells. And so they're in a great position to average the local activity of the nearby network. So you might imagine that their tuning might actually be more on average correct, right? Salt, the, the pyramidal cells are scattered salt and pepper, but these cells might be integrating and averaging. And in fact, that's what happens. When we, when we image in separate experiments in PV cream mice from PV interneurons, those neurons are actually quite precisely localized to the correct columns, which with much less scatter across columns. Okay, so the salt and pepper map seems real among pyramidal cells. Now we also wanted to know, could it be modulated? And I'm gonna show you two examples of how it's gonna be modulated. Okay, one is in the case of attention. And really we can think about this as we measured this tuning in a trained animal. That animal went through multiple days of training and during that training, it's learning to pay attention to certain stimuli and not others. Maybe that's shaping the map, right? We're imagining that we're measuring some inherent property of this organization, but we also know that maps are plastic. Maybe we've trained the map to look like this. So is that true? So we did, in parallel with the study I just showed you, um, a, another version of the task in which we applied to the awake mouse exactly the same stimuli, exactly. The only thing that was different is that now the animal's trained to lick to one, we're presenting two tones, one of the two tones and not the other, and it's not licking to the all whisker stimulus. So we're training the animal attend away from the whiskers, attend towards sound, and particularly tone A. And the animals do this, they're not as good as for the whiskers, but they lick beautifully to the correct S plus tone. They make a lot of mistakes and they, they lick to the other incorrect tone as well, but they lick very, very little to any of the whisker stimuli or to the blanks. And again, this tells us that we've succeeded in the training. These animals are attending to the whisker, uh, to the sound, to the tones, because that's the mistakes they make, and not to the whiskers. So how does this um, affect the map? And here what we find is that the topography of the map is very, very similar. Within each column, this was the whisker cued task I showed you before. Here it is for the sound cued version. About half the cells are tuned for the correct whisker. Half the cells are tuned for another whisker. Although actually, if you notice, there's slightly more cells tuned to the correct whisker in the sound cued task. And this suggests that the tuning of cells within each column is a little bit more similar to each other in the sound cued case. And we could analyze this in more detail and we find that this is absolutely true. And that's what the bottom row shows you here. So, um, what we're computing here on the left are, is tuning similarity between pairs of neurons. We take two neurons in our imaging field, we compute what's called a signal correlation, which is the similarity in the mean tuning curve that's plotted here as a function of the distance between those two cells. And because of the way the cortex is organized, the farther apart two cells are, the less similar the tuning is, so there's an overall slope. But you'll notice that in the sound cued case, tuning similarity is higher between cells in a column, these are all within a column, than in the whisker cued case. And that's consistent with this idea that more cells are tuned for that columnar whisker. If we look not at whisker evoked activity, but noise correlations, which are essentially spontaneous activity that can't be explained by tuning, we see a very similar phenotype, that that falls off with distance as well, which was known, but it falls off more slowly in the uh, sound cued case than in the whisker cued case. And so what this tells us is that both sensory evoked activity and spontaneous uncontrolled activity, right? They're both more similar between neurons in a column when the animal's not attending to the whiskers, and they're less similar within a column when the animal is tuning, is attending to the whiskers. And that actually makes perfect sense, because what it means is that when training and attention has told the animal, pay attention and discriminate what's happening to the whiskers, Cells are now less correlated, they're decorrelated in those columns, right? And that provides um, a better discrimination signal between those uh, different inputs. So the whisker cued task decorrelates neurons within each column. It preserves the overall salt and pepper organization, uh, but it changes these subtle correlations which are in the right direction for improving coding or whisker discrimination. Okay. The second example I wanna tell you about, about can these maps change, is more of a long-term plasticity example, okay? Um, we noticed and we were a little concerned that in all of the experiments that had documented salt and pepper maps, ours and S1, the V1 cases, the A1 cases, they were all done in animals that were raised in the normal rodent you know, housing environments, plucked out one day, and then an imaging experiment was done. But we know that sensory cortex is highly plastic to sensory experience. And in particular, layer 2-3 is very highly plastic. All these salt and pepper maps were found in layer 
We also know that standard rodent laboratory housing is actually a deprived environment. There's not much going on and food falls out of the sky, right? The animals don't have to do very much. So maybe if the animal had richer sensory experience, maybe there would be, that experience would refine, developmentally refine these maps better, and maybe they would become less salt and pepper and more columnar. That is, maybe salt and pepper structure is actually an artifact of how we raise our animals. It's an incompletely developed map. Could that be? So to test this, um, another student in the lab, uh, Amy LeMessurier, um, did a nice study where she um, took animals at the age of weaning, which is um, just about a week after they begin to whisk, and separated litters into one group that had tactile enrichment, which is just toys put in the cage every couple days, um, and the other animals that were raised in standard environments. And she did this in two strains of mice that allow us either to image layer two, three pyramidal cells or layer four excitatory cells. And we're gonna use this to ask, what's the difference in topography of the map between layer four and layer two, three, and how does enrichment or this extra experience um, change that structure, okay? And this is all imaging from excitatory cells from pyramidals. So before I tell you the enrichment effect, let me just tell you the difference between layer four and layer two, three. I mentioned at the outset that layer four cells are clustered into these barrels. And actually the way that thalamic afferents innervate them is that a given afferent essentially innervates the correct barrel. And so actually you'd expect that layer four might be topographically precise, even though layer two, three is salt and pepper. So is that true? And so in normally housed animals, she examined exactly that. Um, here, what we're plotting is what fraction of cells are tuned for the correct whisker for the column as a function of what's the distance of that cell from the center of that column farther and farther away. And what you can see in layer two, three in black is that about 60% of cells in this study were tuned for the correct whisker within the column. And then that fell off slowly over multiple columns. The columns are shown here um, until there's very few cells once you get a few columns away. And that's consistent with the salt and pepper map. If you look in layer four of those in the same normally housed conditions, what you find is that the center of the column in layer four, there's more cells that are correctly tuned, and that tuning drops off much more sharply with space in, in layer four. And so what that means is layer four is in fact more topographically precise, and then somehow those signals are dispersed as they move up into layer two, three. Okay, so now what does enrichment do? Well, enrichment actually increases the fraction of correctly tuned cells in the center of columns. Right? It falls off approximately the same, right? but the height of the, that tuning precision gets higher. And surprisingly, the same thing even happens in layer four. And if you look at these plots on the top with just some example fields, I think what you can see is that after enrichment, there's still salt and pepper organization, but now things actually look a little bit more homogeneous. Okay, so that's one measure of how the maps change with enrichment. Another measure is not thinking about salt and pepper per se at all, but you can, you can study the topography of a map by asking, what is the point representation of a stimulus in the world in the activity of cells across that map? So we wiggle one whisker, and we're gonna use imaging just to ask, how strong is the average response to that stimulus at one location? How does that fall off? That is, what's the hill of activity that you see in S1 uh, in response to that single point stimulus of the periphery? Okay, um, and so what's plotted here is the mean uh, evoked uh, response in delta F over F as a function of position away from the center of that column. And what you can see is that in the normally housed animals, um, you wiggle a whisker, there's the strongest activity in the middle of the corresponding column, and then that falls off gradually, right? And enrichment um, causes the center response to strengthen, right? So the top of the hill gets taller, the flanks stay the same, and so the hill gets slightly sharper with enrichment. Okay, that happens beautifully in layer two, three, and not at all in layer four. And I think you can see this here in the 2D version of these same plots. Here, are these, uh, these are spatial bins of cells around some reference column, and the color scale shows you this strength of response to the reference whisker. And I think what you can see is that when we wiggle the reference whisker in the normally housed animals, um, yes, you get activity within the column, but there's a substantial spread outside the column. And after enrichment, that hill of activity is much more focused within that average column. So enrichment is sharpening up the columnar structure. Um, and actually the strongest evidence we have that the columnar structure is really sharpened comes from those measures of tuning similarity and similarity of noise correlations that I showed you before. And actually in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip one quantification, I'll just show you the other quantification. Okay. Um, these are spatial plots like I just showed you before um, where each of these uh, histogram bins uh, represents lots of cells that were found in a particular spatial bin and cortex 
relative to some reference column whose outline is shown there. And the color scale in this case on the top shows you the mean tuning similarity, the mean signal correlation between cells in this bin and all the cells that were found in that column. So the bluer you get, the higher the tuning similarity. And so what you can see is that in the normally housed case, many, many cells over long distances have high tuning similarity to the average cell within that column. And that's a reflection of the very strong salt and pepper intermixing that happens in those normal, uh, normally housed animals. After enrichment, what you can see is that um, there still is a ring of similarity uh, of cells, but now those are cells that are much more immediately outside the column. And some distance away, now the tuning similarity really drops off. So you can see the development of this columnar structure in tuning similarity with enrichment. And you can see that particularly well if we take this same data and instead of looking at it in 2D, we're just going to collapse it to one single um, distance dimension here along one radial dimension here, which is this dimension. So what's the average tuning similarity as a function of distance to that column center? Um, and here what you can see is that in the normally housed case, um, as you uh, move in distance away from the column center and you cross that column edge, which we can see exactly, we know exactly where it is from the anatomy, there's very little drop off in the signal correlation, meaning tuning doesn't change much. It doesn't respect the column boundaries. But after enrichment, tuning begins to drop off at the column boundary. And the same thing is true even more strongly for noise correlations. Noise correlations are very strong over long distances in the normally housed cortex. They become, become more focused after enrichment. And if you look in the average here, in the normally housed case, again, they're largely flat across that column edge. But after enrichment, they begin to fall off right at the column edge. And so enrichment creates a tuning structure which aligns to the edges of those column boundaries. Okay, So let's summarize this, and I can tell you how, how we think about these data. Okay, so we started out with the question of how is S1 organized? Is every cell in each column simply encoding its corresponding whisker on the face, that is, their single whisker feature detectors, and there are no mistakes within the map? Or is it some very heterogeneous salt and pepper uh, organization where cells within the column are intermixed for lots of different ones? And what I showed you is that the salt and pepper organization is very robust across lots of different ways of measuring it. But it's also plastic, right? And that the more experienced an animal gets, you can get changes in the salt and pepper organization that now begin to finally respect those column boundaries. So the columns seem real, but they're not perfect. They're real and their edges have meanings, but there still are many cells which are pepper within the salt and pepper map. Okay. Okay, oh, and I should say, so the effect of enrichment, how can you think about this on circuit, on the circuit level? We're very interested in this, but we haven't done a single experiment yet. But you can ask, how is it that cells within a column begin to become more similarly tuned? How is it that no noise correlations get actually stronger within a column but fall off across columns? Uh, and one very simple hypothesis is that circuits within a column might strengthen with enrichment, whereas circuits that go across columns might not, or maybe even more inhibition develops across columns. Right? These would both be very simple ways to produce this kind of behavior, and we're very curious to know what actually happens. OK. So um, I want to take the rest of the time to, to answer, I think, a fundamental question about this. Um, there's more organization after tactile enrichment, but there's still salt and pepper structure. So how do we think about that salt and pepper structure? And I want to boil this down to these two linked questions. Is the salt and pepper organization essentially noise within a distributed map? That is, what really matters is some kind of tuning ensemble and not the position of a cell, right? This cell tuned uh, you know, to the wrong whisker within the blue column. Uh, was this a developmental mistake that created that cell? Is that cell simply being averaged out and not used? Or is there some other type of organization that happens here? And the alternative that I would propose is that maybe something else is being represented that we're not even measuring here, and maybe that thing really is coherent across columns. What do I mean by that? When you measure a receptive field in the way that I've been describing, you wiggle one whisker at a time, and you're measuring the response of neurons to individual whisker deflection. You get some tuning, but fundamentally, you're only asking, how do the cells respond to single whiskers? But we know in the natural case that when the animal uses all of its whiskers in the world on objects, 
it's never one whisker that's deflected. Maybe there are more complicated multi-whisker features which are being encoded here, and maybe they're encoded in some coherent way across columns that we're just missing with this organization. Does that make sense? Okay. So, and here's some indication that, that this is not so crazy. So, of course, multiple whiskers move. Meacher Hartman's lab did a really nice um, experiment a few years ago. Um, they had essentially a vertical wall. A rat um, you know, would amble over to the wall and just whisk on it to explore it. And they had a very nice, clever method for being able to detect all of the individual whisker contacts that were made onto that wall by the whisker. Okay? And so what you're seeing here is a trace over time in black of the animal's nose location. It started off kind of where you guys are. It would approach the vertical wall, which is where the screen is. It would hit the wall, and then its nose started off here, and it explored low on the wall for a while, then it started to explore higher and higher on the wall. And in the meantime, all of these colored dots are individual contacts by all the different whiskers, one whiskers, one color, hitting the object. Okay? So lots and lots of whiskers are contacting. And when they, av when they looked at the statistics of this, which you might imagine are very complicated, um, they were able to come away with some uh, simple underlying first order description. So one uh, first order feature, which is not surprising, is that when multiple whiskers contact, it's typically two adjacent multiple whiskers which make the closest contact. Right, that makes sense. And then number two, they can analyze what's the time frame of that. Are the whiskers hitting at exactly the same time or at wildly different times? And what they found is that most of the contacts were happening for adjacent whiskers in a plus or minus 50 millisecond interval. And again, that shouldn't be surprising because the animal's whisking back and forth, and plus or minus 50 milliseconds is basically one contact time before the whiskers retract and go forward again. Okay, so if we want to understand how neurons in S1 might be tuned for complicated multi-whisker patterns, one logical place to start is in how S1 represents adjacent whisker contacts within a plus or minus 50 millisecond interval. And so that's what we did. The space of all multi-whisker combinations is way too big to explore the tuning. But there's a subspace that's tractable, and this subspace that we chose here was a subspace of local, that is adjacent, two whisker combinations and sequences um, with the plus or uh, minus 50 millisecond uh, intervals. So you can imagine a bunch of whiskers on the face. This would be like, you know, this whisker wiggles first and then slightly later this one, or this one first and then this one. What are these? If you think about the whiskers moving on objects, these are essentially local motion vectors on the whisker pad. Okay, so we want to know, is there tuning in this space of local motion vectors? So the experiment is a classic old-fashioned one. Um, and a uh, mouse is anesthetized. We put our nine piezos on the face. We're going to apply exactly the same stimulus to each whisker. But now we're going to present um, lots of different stimuli and map responsiveness within this two-whisker space. This is an anesthetized mouse. Okay? And for these experiments, we're um, recording most of the time in the D1 column. We center the array on that column so that through the array, we can now interleave these different types of stimuli. We either present each individual whisker alone, okay, or all two whisker combinations that involve that central whisker for the column we're recording, which I'm going to call the columnar whisker, or CW. So all combinations of that whisker plus the adjacent surround whiskers. So CW, SW combinations are these adjacent combinations that involve the columnar whisker, or all the other possible two whisker combinations, which are surround whisker, surround whisker combinations. And we do that in this first experiment I'll show you at just a few different delta t's within that relevant ring. And what do we see? Okay. Um, here's an example neuron. Um, each of these bars is the response to one of these complicated two whisker combination stimuli. Here's whisker one, here's whisker two. The black ones are the single whisker stimuli. So this particular neuron spikes best to the single whisker stimulus of the gamma whisker and less to the D1 whisker and on and on. Okay? But if you look at the responses to all these two whisker stimuli, you see there's a bunch of them that drive stronger responses than the single whisker alone. And the favorite one is the combination of gamma and D1. Okay? Here's another cell, same kind of principle, except it likes a different combination. It likes the E2-D1 whisker combination. And we analyzed, when we analyzed this early experiment, what we found is that virtually all cells spike more to a two whisker combination than to a single whisker. So it's reasonable to think cells are are liking these stimuli in some sense. And when we analyze what combinations they like, 70% um, of the cells within a column prefer one of these stimuli. That is, combinations that are 
the, the columnar whisker plus a surround whisker as opposed to something more distant or something non-adjacent. Okay? And not only do they prefer those, but we can make a quantitative measure of how selective they are in their tuning among either the set of CWSW sequences or the set of SWSW sequences. And cells are more selective among these sequences than they are among these sequences. And so that convinced us that there's something in a single column that is representing well and discriminating different two whisker combinations that involve the columnar whisker. Okay? So we did a follow-up study to learn about this in more detail. Okay? And so this experiment is very, very similar. Same anesthetized mouse, same um, stimuli, but now actually we're going to focus on those combinations that involve the columnar whisker with just a few combinations that involve other whiskers. And now we're going to present um, all possible delta Ts, time differences between the whiskers, from minus 50 to plus 50, um, so that we can present a very, very large stimulus set of thousands of stimuli. We record for hours and hours and hours. And then essentially we use a reverse correlation-like method to go back and ask what was the favorite stimulus for each cell. Okay? So what do we find? Here's an example cell. This cell was recorded in the D1 column. And here I'm showing you in the rasters um, the cell's response to the D1, D2 whisker combination or the D1, C2 whisker combination, et cetera. And you can just see here that the cell likes D1, D2. It also likes D1, E1 to some degree, right? If we blow up these rasters, you can see that the individual trials here are actually trials in which we're varying delta T from 50 milliseconds D2 leads D1 to 50 milliseconds in the other direction. That is, we're sampling that whole range. And with a little bit of smoothing on this, we can generate what's essentially a spatiotemporal receptive field or a STRF for these cells in which the pairwise combinations of whiskers are on the bottom and delta T is on the y-axis. And you can see that this particular cell, which is this one, prefers D1, D2 combination at a particular time delay of about 30 milliseconds D2 leading D1. Okay? So we're going to do that for all the cells. And statistically, we're going to figure out which cells are significantly tuned for one particular combination over all the others. Okay? And what we find when we do that is tremendous tuning for two whisker combinations in a space that I hope I can convince you looks like an intuitive real space um, for tuning. Okay. So I'm going to um, focus first on the spatial tuning, that is tuning for the different combinations. We're going to ignore time. For each cell, we found the, the optimal delta T, and this analysis is just of that delta T. Okay. So here's one cell that's recorded in the D1 column. Um, the green here is the spike count to D1, D2 combination, or D1, C2, or D1, C1. And these are organized in the same layout as they are on the face. Okay? So you can see that this cell loves D1, D2. The asterisk shows its favorite response. And it responds to all the other combinations with D1 much, much less. Okay? Now, what are these other things? The dashed black line is the response to D1 alone. And the red line is the predicted linear response to the combinations that we applied. And we're using the predicted linear response here as kind of a boring outcome. If the cells responded with the same number of spikes as you'd predict from the sum of the individual whiskers, we would say there's no particular computation that's going on. There's not you know, much happening. But you can see what happens. This cell responds to its favorite stimulus with pretty much the same number of spikes you would predict linearly. And it responds to all the other combinations with dramatically fewer spikes. That is. It's sharpening a two-whisker tuning curve from the predicted values of its inputs. Okay? And that's what this cell does also. This cell likes C1 and B2. That's what this cell does. It likes C1 and C2. This cell does the same kind of thing, except its favorite response, it actually manages to generate a stronger response to the favorite combination than was predicted linearly. And that is what it turns out that 50% of cells in S1 do. I'm just going to flash up a number of other examples to convince you there's a lot of them. The only thing I would ask you to take away from this is that all of them obey this pattern that they sharpen relative to the predicted linear sum. And they're all pointing in different directions, meaning that different CWSW combinations are represented in each column as kind of a basis set, maybe, for representing these stimuli. OK. So um, I'm going to skip this quantification, but the bottom line is that we can do a number of different statistical procedures to convince ourselves and hopefully, hopefully others that this tuning is real, 
and that the tuning is absolutely sharper than the predicted linear sum. And actually, I'll just show you this one panel. This is the selectivity of measured responses to these two whisker stimuli, and this is the predicted selectivity if the cell were responding linearly. The vast majority of cells sharpen their tuning. And they sharpen it in a way that's represented by the example cell I showed you before. They're sculpting a weaker response to all but one single preferred stimulus. And the preferred stimulus, they respond to pretty darn linearly. Okay? And that suggests maybe inhibition is suppressing spikes to non-preferred stimuli, but somehow allowing spikes through for preferred stimuli. Okay. So that was about tuning for space. I'll just show you one thing on tuning for time. Cells are, in fact, tuned for time difference for delta T as well. That tuning can be fairly narrow. This is the average response of neurons to different stimuli that have um, different delta Ts centered on the, whatever the best delta T is for the cell. And so the width of this peak is about 10 milliseconds. And that means that cells have, on average, 10 millisecond resolution in determining which whisker went first and by how much. Okay? Um, and I'm not going to show you the data, but most neurons like one particular tuning best. They like it when a surround whisker is wiggled before the columnar whisker, and not in the opposite direction, not columnar before surround. What does that mean in terms of local motion on the face? The cells prefer local motion that's inbound to their columnar whisker. Okay? And so lots of cells are doing this. And it, very importantly, those cells that were the pepper in the salt and pepper map that were tuned for the wrong whisker for the column, they do this really well. What most of those cells prefer is a combination of their favorite single neighboring whisker with the columnar whisker. And so overall, 70% of all cells in the column prefer a CWSW sequence, as I said. 50% um, of those mistuned cells actually prefer that same class of stimuli. And 85% of the neurons that are tuned for the columnar whisker also prefer that. So there's tremendous prevalence of this type of tuning. OK. Um, I'm going to skip the decoding, but I'll just tell you that we can. what this suggests is that there are populations of cells within a column which are diversely tuned for different CWSW sequences. And therefore, you can decode, or the column might represent, or we can decode from the population activity in the column, which two whisker sequence occurred. And that turns out to be quite true. We can decode that actually quite well, much, much better than simple linear prediction. OK, so what is mapped in whisker S1? There's clearly salt and pepper tuning when you measure it for single whisker stimuli. But what do you find if you use this particular simple, simple subset of multi-whisker stimuli? You find that many of those cells that were tuned for the wrong whisker in single whisker space are, in fact, tuned for local motion from some surround whisker moving towards, in an inbound direction, towards the columnar whisker. OK? So this map in S1 is not a simple somatotopic map. This map has salt and pepper organization. But that organization doesn't just reflect noise. It reflects something coherent. And we think one thing that's being reflected here is that this organization reflects cells tuned for local multi-whisker motion and a particular type. Um, we propose at the bottom here that what each column is doing is it's representing both single whisker features, of course. But in addition, the set of all local motion sequences that are inbound to the whisker. And this would be a new way of thinking about what's represented at the columnar level. And I should say that there are a few very nice papers, uh, this is actually just a couple, there are more, that have been searching for higher order features that are represented um, in S1. And there's been lots of suggestions for what these might be. People have focused on very high order properties like large scale coherent motion across the whole pad, for example. Um, but what we're suggesting here is if you think on local elementary levels, you can see very robust tuning across many, many. Finally, if you think about how a neuron might be constructing this narrow tuning for two whisker sequences by sculpting its response to the linear prediction, this is very, very similar to a computation that many of you may have seen before. This is direction selectivity in motion, in visual motion, right? Visual motion, like even in the retina, um, neurons will receive inputs from lots of local locations in space, but they might only respond when a bar is being swept in one direction and not in the other direction. How do they do that? They, they do that through a very specific and quite beautiful inhibitory circuit that's been described that suppresses the cell's response to the non-preferred direction of motion. 
That's exactly what's going on here. There's some kind of suppression, we don't know what it is, that's inhibiting the response of the cell to the non-preferred inputs, but allowing the preferred input to get through unscathed. And so maybe this is a hint that there's some kind of common sensory computation going on here in cortex there in the retina that's pulling out some useful features of the sensory world. Okay, so how have we understood these salt and pepper maps? Higher order feature selectivity is intermixed in rodents. And I, and I would argue that's why we see this apparently disor disordered map, because these cells actually are tuned for other higher order features. There is some of that feature tuning in primary cortex of larger animals as well, but we think of it as taking place in downstream higher order cortical areas. Maybe there's just not enough cortical territory in rodents to do that all in some higher dedicated area. Maybe more of that is done intermixed within primary cortex. The columns that were proposed by Mountcastle, um, I would argue that they do exist despite this, but cells don't share all exactly the same tuning, which was his primary proposal. They share related tuning features. And in our case, the related feature is local motion that involves the columnar whisker in some way. And this suggests that columns are in fact important for computation, but exactly how we still don't know. Okay, so all the work I showed you today was done by four students. Kelly Clancy, super talented graduate student who now is a postdoc with Tom Mersick-Flogel. Amy Lemus, she did the uh, original salt and pepper description. Uh, Amy Lemassurier did the um, enrichment um, experiment, and she just finished her PhD. Hanshin Wang is a postdoc. He did um, the awake experiment for measuring receptive fields in awake animals. And Kevin Leboy Juarez um, did all the work on two whisker combination tuning. So thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, so, so the question is, um, do we also see a map of the local motion preference? And actually, the, the primary way I would predict that that map would take place is actually within a single column. I would imagine that the neurons on one side of the column, let's say towards D2, they prefer D2 motion inbound to the whisker. On the other side, they prefer the other way. That's absolutely a prediction. We are gearing up right now to do the, uh, those experiments with calcium imaging, but we wanted to do that in the awake case. So actually, we were waiting for the awake behavior to be good enough for that, and it's ready now, basically. So that's the next thing to look at. Yeah. Far away, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, we've had, a, so the question is, uh, it, when we look at signal or noise correlations, like after enrichment, they do fall off around the central column, but they often oddly pop back up again on the edges. And so we've had some debate in the lab about this. Um, in the way that we're normalizing the position, the normalization is quite accurate around the column, but once you get far away from the column, there's variation across animals about exactly which column you're in. And so what we need to do is an, another analysis of that data to figure out, um, is that tuning systematically related in some way to the anatomical location of those cells? And that's our hypothesis, but I can't answer that for you yet. Good question. Correlation. Right. Right. Correlation. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great that's a great question. So what um, so, did we do a task in which an animal was changing his attention from auditory to visual and back, uh, auditory to whisker and back again, um, and then we see that effect? No, those were actually separately trained groups of animals. So we do not know yet whether that's a training effect or an attention effect. However, we're now, we've developed now a new task in the lab, which is a cued attention task, with the hope of getting at exactly that. As you might know, those are quite challenging to train in mice. 
Um, but I think we're getting there. So I, I want to be able to answer that, but I cannot tell you that. That would be very exciting if that's true, particularly because we can do you know, all the cell type specific imaging to try to figure out what's the circuit basis for that if the correlations are changing. Yeah. Yeah, so, so is the map salt and pepper just because the brain is shrunk and there's no room to separate things out well? Um, I mean, certainly some people have made that argument, but I think you need to be maybe more precise in the alternative that you're suggesting. So for example, in the extreme, you might say that maybe there's not enough cortical space in mice to have separate higher level areas and all that processing has to be intermixed in primary areas. And we know that's not true, right? Because around visual cortex V1 of mice, there's an array of beautiful higher order areas that seem to be doing higher order feature extraction. They're much smaller, right, than you get in primates, but they do exist. Whether that could be true at the columnar scale, the way I would phrase that, is um, there are going to be developmental processes and plasticity processes that help to create and shape the circuits that are building the columns, right? And those are going to have some inherent spatial scale. Maybe the scale is such in rodents that you can't precisely wire down to that level. And I think that argument you know, has some merit, perhaps. But then there's the counter observation that um, like when Mersic Flogel has looked for synaptic connectivity between cells that have the same tuning but are dispersed within the map, there's very precise, beautiful organization of that. So at some level, the brain is able to make very specific wiring. So my gut feeling is there's something correct in the question that you're asking, but so far we don't have a good, or the field I don't think has um, a good, you know, mechanistic, specific explanation for why it exists. Very high-level question. Um, talked about V1 and vision and the salt and pepper, and then went on to the whisker system. Care to hazard this conjecture about just somatic sensation in general in the skin? Uh, it would be a total speculation. Is there salt and pepper in the skin? Um, I will say that um, when, when people have done fairly basic experiments um, characterizing topography within the body map, not the face map in S1, like with classic tungsten electrodes that just creep along. Um, there's certainly orderly organization, but it's not perfect. It's already very clear from those papers that it's not perfect. In fact, it's less perfect than I think was suggested on average from the early whisker work. So I would suspect that it occurs, but it hasn't been looked at. So to maybe my we really notice it in the barrel map, for example, when we're sort of thinking about individual columns and being off or having errors, whereas in the body, we may sort of this continuum may be less aware of this. I, I agree. I think there's an you know, interesting ongoing discussion about whether um, different cortical, different sensory areas, for example, in rodents are all doing the same thing or are uniquely different from each other, right? And the barrel cortex, because it has those barrels, it seems like, well, may, maybe it's different. But many, many of these features are the same. Um, I would argue that um, these primary cortices are very similar to each other. Barrel cortex is a useful place to do this work because we have beautiful anatomical markers of where the column boundaries are, and that makes it very possible to do this precisely. But so far, we haven't seen a phenomenon here which seems completely out of the ordinary for other areas. But I think this is the organizational principle. One last one. When you presented, one of those, like, I feel like this one, or stimulate this one. Exploring all possible delta T's. There's a lot of overlap between them, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so um, the way that we made the stimulus space tractable for these experiments was by not probing single whisker kinematics at all. So what we did was we took um, a waveform for how you move a single whisker that had been determined by Dan Schulz's group using reverse correlation as like an optimal stimulus for driving S1 spiking in rats. And we used that as the fixed stimulus that we never varied from whisker to whisker. The only thing that we varied was which whisker was being wiggled and the delta T. So it would be very interesting to know how this correlates with 
other types of tuning features, but the dimensionality explodes and how to fit all those stimuli within an experiment becomes, I think, pretty much impossible. Well, let's thank Dan one last time.